Okay, uh, welcome everyone to the 33, sorry, the 33rd episode of the SFU Sports Analytics Virtual Seminar Series. Uh, today we have Jeremy Briand uh, from the University of Montreal uh, in the Institut National de Spoil de Quebec, uh, who's going to speak to us about mathematical modeling for understanding and optimizing high intensity interval training. Uh, Jeremy is currently finishing his master's on high intensity interval training modeling at the Université de Mon Montreal. In 2019, he obtained his BSc in physics with a specialization in mathematics at McGill University. He also works as a research assistant at the Institut National de Spoil de Quebec. He's an international level triathlete competing for Canada on the World Cup and World Triathlon Series circuits. In his research, Jeremy is looking to join his high performance sports experience to his physics and mathematics knowledge in order to provide more efficient tools for sport practitioners and help athletes reach their full potential. And uh, on the work he's uh, going to describe today, he has uh, co-authors are Dr. Ki uh, Guy Thibault, who's an adjunct uh, professor at the Université de Montreal, as well as Dr. Jonathan Tremblay, an associate professor at the University of Montreal as well. And both uh, of those uh, uh, folks are uh, former directors of sports science at the Institut National de Sport de Quebec. And Guy just retired this year, so congratulations, Guy, and uh, hopefully you're enjoying your uh, extra free time. Uh, maybe you don't have any, I don't know. <laughs> Um, so both are on the call today, which I'm really uh, pleased about. And um, yeah, so for today, uh, in terms of the talk uh, abstract, so interval training is a time efficient method to elicit fitness promoting physiological adaptations. It has been adapted by elite athletes for more than a century and has recently gained interest in the clinical world as a promising way to improve the health of patients. However, designing interval training sessions is challenging because many parameters can be modulated. So things like the, the effort uh, interval inten intensity and duration, the rest interval intensity and duration, the number of repetitions, the exercise modality, and so on. Each of these parameters influences the level of difficulty in the training sessions, physiological adaptations and responses. Tools exist to help the practitioners modulate these parameters and even predict how well an athlete will perform on a continuous or intermittent effort given their current abilities. In this talk, uh, Jeremy will explore the main continuous and intermittent models that currently exist and are used by practitioners in the field. He will employ both he employs both simple and more complex models and will provide examples of how critical thinking in the use of simple models that are commonly implemented in the field can improve the interpretations practitioners make. He will also discuss the more complex models, such as a hydraulic model or the new, newly developed ability to pursue model which better represent physiology, but are sufficiently simple for practical inf implementation. So with that, I wanna thank uh, Jeremy for joining us and presenting today, and uh, we'll turn it over to you. I will share my screen now. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so can you see my presentation? Yeah, I can. It's not on slideshow mode. I have like this. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. I will. Yeah, I'll put it in slideshow. Perfect. All right. So thanks. Thanks, Dave, uh, for the uh, opportunity. And uh, yes, uh, so uh, as you mentioned in your in your introduction, uh, as most of you probably know, um, interval training is, a, is an efficient method. And uh, for instance, it, it has been used by athletes, uh, by elite athletes for over a century to improve performance. And uh, recently, it has gained popularity amongst uh, patients and the recreational population, um, notably uh, what we call the uh, high intensity interval training or HIIT. And uh, these models, uh, well, well uh, models can be used to uh, optimize or better understand the, the prescription and the analysis that we do of uh, interval training. And our current work at the University of Montreal consists of uh, understanding and improving, uh, potentially improving those mo those models, and uh, and we want to uh, uh, thank the the Fédération des Québécois des Sports Cyclistes, the FQSC, which is one of the major contributor to uh, to our project. So uh, yes, we want to thank them for the support in the meantime. So uh, yes, yeah, so I, uh, I'm gonna start with the, just a, a funny uh, anecdote uh, on on this picture. Actually, uh, when I I had a class uh, last semester, and uh, one of uh, one of my professor came to me and asked me if I was uh, doing triathlon. So uh, so I, I I said yes, and then he showed me this picture, and he said that when he uh, when he did his presentation to be hired as a, as a professor at the University of Montreal, uh, he used that picture uh, in his presentation. So it, it was a, a funny coincidence, but. 
But yes, as Dave mentioned, uh, I, I'm a, an elite uh, level uh, triathlete. Uh, I compete on, on the world triathlon stage. Uh, I'm still a, an active athlete. Um, so uh, I was national champion in 2019 and, uh, and uh, I'm pursuing my dream of uh, participating uh, at the Olympic Games uh, in Paris in 2024. So one of my major passion in, in life has always been sports and I've been training for as long as I can uh, remember. And I also have a second passion in life, which is uh, mathematics. I, I like uh, solving mathematical problems, especially those that have uh, concrete applications in real life. And that's why I did my bachelor, uh, my undergrad in, uh, in physics at McGill University. And shortly after graduating in 2019, that's where I met uh, Guy, uh, so Guy Thibault. Uh, and, and I had the opportunity to combine my two passions and, uh, and, and, uh, work on a project which applies mathematics to uh, interval training. So today uh, the plan is uh, to look at the, the current uh, interval training models. Um, we're we're going to look at uh, what, what they are and uh, we're going to look at their, uh, their limitations and their strength. And uh, at the end, as Dave mentioned, we will look at uh, the, the different potential avenues and uh, how we can improve. Uh, and yes, if it, like what, what kind of models that we can uh, can look at for, for the future. So the first question that we may ask is uh, what, what is uh, interval training model? So uh, interval training, uh, what is interval training? So interval training is simply uh, a method that alternates periods of uh, periods of effort and recovery in a more or less organized way. So in the scientific literature, there's a lot of studies that have uh, explored the effects of interval training, and use, usually they use uh, some, some, some sessions that are almost chosen arbitrarily. For example, uh, uh, some, some very classic sessions, such, such as like uh, six repetitions of two, minutes of two minutes of effort, two minutes of recovery, and, and so on. Those are like sessions that we're used to see, but... Uh, one of the key questions that we can ask is uh, how do we come up with a, a session with the, the, the right parameters to optimize the, the, the training response or optimize the degree of difficulty given, uh, given the goals of the practitioner or the, the, the particular athlete that you're working with. And it's important to understand that uh, in interval training, there's a, a lot of parameters that can that compose a session and that can be modulated. For instance, you can, you can have different number of sets uh, and in between the sets, you can have a, a different uh, rest duration uh, and you can rest at a different intensity. And each set is composed of a certain number of uh, re effort repetition that are performed at a, for a certain duration at a certain intensity. And in between each repetition, you have a, a recovery that is performed at a certain duration and a certain intensity. And also you have, of course, um, the exercise modality. And all those parameters uh, interact with each other and have an influence on the physiological response and on the, 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 the degree of difficulty that, the, that you may experience when you, you perform a, an interval training session. And some tools or some models can be useful to better understand and better, um, and, and better set those parameters in order to have a session that, that matches the, the degree of difficulty or the physiological response that you're looking for. And so uh, today we're going to go through uh, five of, the, of the, the different interval training models that exist. Those are the five, the five most common. So uh, there's the purity uh, running tables, which is probably the first one. And then we're going to go through the, the Thibault graphical model. And then we're going to go through uh, the Morton and Bia model, the Skiba model, the Coggan model to which we applied a, a modification that I'm going to explain to you. And at the end, we're gonna we're gonna talk about how these five models uh, inspired us to go through a different pathway that a, a, a sort of a new model that we call the ability to pursue model, and uh, we're gonna cover that at the end of this presentation. And so the purity model is one of the first uh, the first model interval training model that came up. So purity um, in in the early seventies dis discovered the uh, an empirical relationship between the number of repetition in, in a training session 
and the relative velocity at which they can be performed. And when I say a, a relative velocity, I mean, for example, if you go, um, so for example, the 80% relative velocity is simply, if you do a, a, a two minute effort interval, the relative velocity, if it's 80%, it means that you will go at 80% of your maximal velocity that you can sustain over a two minute period of time. So Purity found an empirical relationship between the relative intensity and the number of repetition. And with these, this, uh, and with this re uh, relationship, he built some tables. And for instance, the athlete, uh, so the athlete was attributed a point, a point score. For instance, let's say the, the, on this table on the right, you can see the point level is uh, 700. So the athlete's best performance that he can find in some performance table um, is equivalent to a 700 points. And then with that, he is referred to the table. And then the athlete in the model uh, is able to choose a distance, for example, 200 meters. And then the athlete can, can choose a, a certain relative uh, intensity, for example, 80%. And the model will provide the number of repetition that the athlete should perform and the rest in between the repetition. So it's, it's a quite simple model. And it's a very popular model. So it was used uh, from the 1970s up till now. And uh, it's, it's been used by many coaches. And a lot of sessions that you will find in those tables are very classic session that you find in a, in a track and field program, for example. And it's, it's a great tool because it just provides some, some general guidelines to a, a practitioner or, or a coach who wants to... Uh, to provide some good interval training session for their athletes. Uh, there are some cons, obviously. The, the model was built for running and it's only a, a, applicable for running. You cannot use it necessarily for, for cycling or other exercise modality. And, and also in his book, Purity talks about like the sessions are meant to be, um, to reflect the maximal training effect, which, have, which is a very subjective, uh, uh, it's, it's a very subjective way of uh, um, quantifying if we want the degree of difficulty of the session. Uh, so the, the, the model was not really validated to see if each of the session um, is equivalent in terms of degree of difficulty or in terms of benefit. Um, and so that's something that, uh, that is lacking with this model. It, there's a lot of subjectivity within the, the empirical relationship that exists behind the tables. Um, also, the model provides only some fixed rest and some limited number of repetitions. So, and, and also it's impossible to build sets. So it's very limited in terms of how you can play with the, the type of session uh, once you have decided your relative intensity, for instance. And that's the, the and, and then after the purity model, uh, so Guy, uh, my, my supervisor has used the, the purity model a lot when he was a, a runner. And he came up with the, the Tsubo uh, graphical model. So this is the first model I was introduced to when I started working on, on the project. Um, essentially, what, uh, what he did is that he adapted the, the PureD uh, model. Uh, so instead of representing the intensity as a relative velocity, he represented the intensity as a, a relative, uh, as a, a percentage of your maximal aerobic power. So each line that you see on the graph, it, um, so each dot on, on, on a single line is performed at the same intensity. And this intensity represents a, a percentage of your maximal aer aerobic power. And each line represents a different percentage of your maximal aerobic power. So the model, um, is quite synthetic. As you see, instead of having a lot of table, everything is summarized on a single graph. And that's particularly useful for coaches because all the information is at the same place and you don't have to look uh, through tables and go back and forth. So on, on, on that side, it's, it's very useful. And at, at the meantime, um, it allows the creation of sets. So yeah, as you see, the model will propose, uh, depending on how many repetitions that you have, to form sets, for instance, let's say uh, two sets of 10 repetitions. And that's something that the, the, the purity model was not proposing. Also, because the, the model is in percentage of the maximal aerobic, aerobic power, and that power is a, 
is a, uh, a measure of, of work. Uh, it's, it's a more universal model and it can be applied to different exercise modality, for example, cycling or uh, even uh, rowing, but also uh, to some extent, uh, velocity is also in, in many cases linear with power. So you can also use it for velocity. So it, it's a model that can be used for a lot of uh, different exercise, uh, modality of exercises. Um, again, the same problem arises that with purity is that although the model has been used quite extensively by a lot of athletes, uh, especially in Quebec for the last 20 years. Um, so a lot of coach use this model, use uh, this model on a, on a regular basis. It has not been truly validated to see if each session is equivalent in terms of degree of difficulty or benefits. And also the main critique is that once you select a session, you cannot change the amount of rest and you cannot, um, you cannot explore how changing the rest will affect the number of repetition and so on. And so we can look at a different type of model to solve that problem and, and find a model that will allow you to have a, a lot more uh, liberty on how to play with the, the rest duration. And, uh, and so Morton and Bia uh, in 2004, they came up with a model that allows you to do just that, like to, to, to experience and play with different uh, rest duration. And what they did essentially is they adapted the critical power model to uh, intermittent exercise. So before going uh, any further, I'm gonna take a few minutes to review the critical power model. So the critical power model, I assume uh, most of you are familiar with this model. It's uh, probably the, the most well-known uh, continuous exercise model. Um, it highlights a, a relationship between the power and the, the time to exhaustion. So the power on the y-axis and the time to exhaustion on the, on the, the x-axis. And uh, what we found is a, an, a, an hyperbolic relationship. So um, on the left, you can clearly see that. So, the, so uh, you can clearly see the, the, the hyperbolic relationship. And the way the model works is that um, an, at, uh, we, uh, an athlete will, uh, will do uh, uh, several, maybe between three and five uh, tests where it will be, uh, it will pedal, the athlete will pedal at, at a fixed power for uh, until exhaustion. And usually you wanna use time, uh, time to exhaustion between two and 15 minutes. At least that's, what, uh, that's what's referred to in the, in the scientific literature. And then once you have those, uh, those data points, you can fit the model. So you, you see on the left, uh, we fitted the hyperbolic model, but the problem can also be uh, linearized. So on the right, you see that on the x-axis, instead of having the, the time to exhaustion, we simply have one over the time to exhaustion. And now it becomes a simple linear relationship where the slope is what we call the W prime and the y-intercept is the critical power. So the CP and, and so the W prime, as you can see on the, on the left, it's a quantity of energy. Uh, it's simply a, an anaerobic reserve. And when the athlete works, and the critical power is the, asym the, uh, the horizontal asymptote of the hyperbolic model. So when an athlete works above the critical power, he depletes progressively his W prime. And when the W prime is completely exhausted, uh, depleted, the athlete is, uh, is assumed to be exhausted. And so what the Morton and, uh, and Bia model did is that they, they, uh, they, they kept the fact that over the critical power, there's a depletion of the, the, the W prime in a linear manner, but they also added the fact that below the critical power, the, criti uh, the W prime was replenished in a, in a linear manner as well. And so there's been, quite a lot of studies um, that, that were done to, uh, to assess if the recovery was actually performed in, in, that, in that way, in a linear manner. And what was found is that um, the recovery is not quite linear, but it's more um, curvy linear or actually exponential. And that's something that uh, the Skiba model brings up. So it's essentially a very similar model, but instead of having a linear uh, replenishment of the, the W prime, the W prime is now replenished in a, an exponential manner. 
And so Skiba first presented it in 2012, an integral version of the model, which works with a convoluted integral. And uh, this method is quite uh, computationally heavy. And then uh, in uh, 2015, uh, Dave Clark uh, proposed a, an, a, a similar method, a, a slightly different method to calculate the same model, which is the, the, the ordinary differential equation uh, version of the model. And, and this method is a lot less computationally heavy. And this opened the door to use this model um, in commercial applications. And for instance, now at the moment, I know that there are some athletes who use the, the V' prime model, uh, the Skiba model to track their W' prime uh, in real time as they cycle in a race, for example. And so the, the next model is a completely, completely different model. And for instance, at first sight, it's more like a, it's not quite an interval training model, but it's more a, a way to quantify training load, but we can use it to, um, using the training load quantification, we can use it to analyze and even prescribe uh, interval training sessions. So it's the Coggin model. And uh, you might be familiar with the, the metrics. So the normalized power, the intensity factor, the TSS, um, those metrics uh, are, when I started working on the project, I've heard of those metrics, but I didn't know exactly how they were calculated. So we can do a, a quick overview of the normalized power. For instance, the, the, the main idea, like Coggin started with, a, with, a, with an idea at first. And the idea was that the, the physiological response to exercise are not, are, are not really uh, curvy, or sorry, the physiological response to exercise are curvy linearly related to intensity. So for instance, if you say going from 100 watts to 150 watts is a 50 watt difference and going from 800, 800 watts to 850 watts is also a 50 watt difference, but the, the latest is a lot more difficult than the first one. And so the normalized power is meant to represent that curvy linear response to exercise, uh, the, the curvy, linear, curvy linear response of exercise to intensity. And so what the normalized power does is simply, it takes a 30 second rolling average throughout the whole training session. And for every 30 second window, it calculates the fourth power of um, the, the power. And then it takes the mean of each window. And at the end, it takes the fourth root of the whole, like the ensemble of windows. And what you get is a, is a, a better representation than taking simply the average power over your workout. So when I heard about normalized power, um, people were always very happy to, at the end of the race, to uh, report their normalized power instead of their average power, because the normalized power is always higher than the, than the average power. And uh, Coggin also calculates an intensity factor. So the intensity factor is the relative intensity index. So it's simply the normalized power divided by the FTP. So the FTP is the functional threshold power and it's essentially uh, the maximal average power an athlete can maintain over an hour. But there's a, there's a problem with, uh, with this method. And essentially is that the, the FTP is only a single measurement. It only represents what, what an athlete can do over a single hour. So for instance, two athletes can have the same FTP, but one can be a lot better on shorter durations and the other one can be much more endurant and be much better on, on longer durations. And also it's, it's only a relative index. So it doesn't like, um, so for instance, if you say uh, you have a, an intensity factor, the intensity, the, the intensity factor can go above one and it can go below one. It's, all, it, it's, very, it's, uh, it's gonna vary depending on the duration of the session. So we, uh, we propose a slight modification to the model and if you want to go over the mathematical proof, it's in uh, the article that, uh, that we published, but essentially what we propose is uh, instead of uh, we're looking at the, the intensity factor, we propose a difficulty ratio, which is simply the ratio of the normalized power to the maximal power. And the maximal power is the, the maximal power that the athlete can sustain over the session's duration. And what this does is that it, it's a very relative index that's going to take into account 
the the characteristic of a, of the athlete much more than just looking at the uh, functional functional threshold power and so if the, the 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 difficulty ratio is one the athlete is exhausted and so using this using the the, the session we have a, a criteria with the Cargan model where we can assess when the athlete is exhausted and so um the skiba and the modified Cargan model uh have some uh, some limitations and that's what we highlighted in uh, in the article that we we published in uh, in january so basically what we did is we uh, started by simulating three athletes profiles so you can see on the graph on the right we have uh, three different athletes in yellow we have a, a a sprinter which is very good on short duration so it has a a very high anaerobic capacity, but a very low endurance. We have a, an all-rounder in green, which is an athlete that's pretty average in terms of anaerobic capacity and endurance. And in blue, we have a time trialist, which is uh, the one with the lowest anaerobic capacity, but the highest uh, endurance. And so for each fictitious athlete profile, we, we had them perform uh, 6,198 training sessions that would lead to exhaustion according to both the Skiba and the modified Kogan models. So for the Skiba models, what we did is that we, we made the session such that the, 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 the power output during the session would, uh, would completely empty the W prime at the end of the session. And for the modified Kogan models, we made it such that the normalized power at the end of the session was matching the the the, the athletes, the fictitious athletes' um, record performance um, over the session's duration. And what we found is sessions that are impossible to perform. And when we when we say impossible session, it means that in order to get to exhaustion, according to the Skiba and the modified Kogan model. Uh, the athlete would have to surpass his best performance on every single um, on every single effort uh, in effort interval. So, for instance, if you have a, a training session with five times a minute, the athlete would have to go above his uh, maximal power over a, a minute five times in order to get to exhaustion, according to to the ski bar or the modified Kogan models. So, if you look at the the figure. Um, the, 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 the black dots represent uh, the sessions that were, that were impossible following our simulations. And uh, the main observations is that those, those impossible sessions, uh, they arise when the, the effort interval were short. There was a long rest in between the effort intervals. And the intensity was always super maximal, so uh, above the maximal um, aerobic power. And it's always it was always in uh, in setups where there was a low number of repetitions. And also, you can see that um, the Kogan modify model led to a lot less uh, impossible sessions than the Skiba model, and also that. Um, the, the 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 profile of the athlete had an influence on the number of uh, of uh, impossible sessions that were observed. So, for instance, uh, it, for both models, sprinters were displaying a lot less impossible sessions than time trialists. And uh, so, so, so uh, traditionally, uh, in the moderate or the the heavy intensity um, domains, so when you do long continuous intervals, you work in that intensity domain and uh, as you can see, for those type of intensity, we didn't really uh, see any impossible sessions. So the models seemed to, to work well in that zone. But for super maximal intensity, so work above um, VO2 max, we found some impossible sessions. And what that means is that, uh, is that the, the practitioners who are using those models to prescribe, in, um, to prescribe sessions in that intensity domain they should be they should be careful and they should pay uh, pay attention because their interpretation of the model might be biased because the the what the model gives is not necessarily what the athlete will will feel or the response that will uh, the, 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 you know that so basically um, 
Yes. And uh, the super maximal intensity, traditionally, it wasn't really used by practitioners, but more and more it's getting used. So for instance, nowadays athletes use um, super maximal intensity. Uh, they, they use the model uh, to track their W prime in races, or they, they use the model to predict uh, when they will get exhausted during a race. So it, it, it's particularly important to know the limitations of the model and to know that uh, the interpretation that you make when you use the model for super maximal intensity might not be quite as uh, accurate as when you use it for traditional exercise. And now we can ask why exactly we find those limitations. And uh, the, the answer for the, the Coggin uh, modified model is a bit more uh, obvious. It's, it's probably due to the, 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 the fact that during the normalized power calculations, we raise the power to the, 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 the fourth, we raise the, the, the power output to the fourth power. And the, power, the fourth power might not be a, a universal, you know, it might be different from one athlete to the other. And also for super maximal intensity, because you change of, uh, you change the, uh, there, there's an anaerobic contribution. So now uh, it, when you work in that intensity domain, there might be a different exponent that, that, that should be used to, uh, to better represent the, the physiological response to, uh, to exercise. On the other end, the, the, the Skiba model, the main reason why we observe these, uh, these impossible session is the critical power model. So, so for the Skiba model, a lot of critiques or a lot of uh, uh, ways to improve the model have been proposed towards the, uh, the, the replenishment of the W prime. But the, the impossible sessions that we observe are directly related to the, the, the model that works behind the Skiba model, which is the critical power model. And in fact, this model, the critical power model is quite simplistic. Um, and it's also quite convenient to use the critical power model to, uh, to, in, uh, to, uh, to adapt it to uh, intermittent exercise because um, there's a limit, the critical power, and it's, it's pretty easy to say that above the limit you deplete, below the limit, the limit you replete. And then it becomes a, a very easy model to apply to intermittent exercise. However, it might be too simplistic. And uh, there's been a lot of debate around the, the critical power model over the years. And now I'm just listing you uh, some, some, some titles of articles. And this one... Uh, the, the, the article uh, over 50 years of critical power fact or artifact. There's been a lot of, uh, of comments going back and forth and uh, it's an interesting read if you want, but there's been a lot of debate around the, the, the critical power model. And we're gonna go through three scenarios that just gonna give you maybe a bit more perspective on why it's, uh, it's debated as much. So, uh, the first thing is if we take some real data and we fit the model, here's what I did. So the blue dots that you see on the left are uh, actual uh, recorded power data from an athlete. And on this uh, power data, I fitted the, 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 the critical power model. And so I obtained uh, a critical power of uh, 262 watts with a W prime of 15.8 uh, 15 uh, kilojoules. And then if you look on the right, you can see uh, the residuals. So the residuals is simply the difference between the, the, the model and uh, the, the, the power difference between the model and uh, the actual points, the, the blue dots. And you see that, um, that for very short durations, the model blows up. So the, the, the power error, it goes to above uh, 400 watts. So the, the, the model is 400 watts and more above the actual uh, data points. And in, in fact, if you look at the model mathematically, um, when the, the, the duration of uh, exercise tends to zero, the power will go towards uh, infinity. And just as a, a quick example, the model predicts that for uh, uh, the, 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 the same athlete, for one second effort, the athlete could produce uh, 16,000 watts, for two seconds, uh, 8,000 watts, and for five seconds, uh, almost uh, uh, 3,500 watts. 
So it's like ridiculous numbers for what we know uh, is possible for an athlete. And you can see that the, the range of convergence of the, the, the model with the data is very small. So it's probably a window of uh, between two, uh, two minutes and 30 minutes where the, the points are actually close to, uh, to the model. And then uh, the error as the duration gets longer starts, uh, starts getting larger. And that's because of the, uh, the critical power asymptote. So basically uh, beyond that point, uh, the athlete's uh, record performance are below the critical power. And, and uh, the second example I'm going to give you, it's about the, the, the measuring tools that we use when we work with the critical power model. So for instance, if I want to use the critical power and I, I'm going to use the same number for the, the, the critical power and the W prime as, a, as a, in the previous slide, but if I want to use the critical power to uh, to manage my effort over a 20 minute time to exhaustion uh, time trial, for instance, like a, a 1200 seconds test. So theoretically with the model, I know I could maintain 275.2 watts, but let's say my power meter is not accurate and it reads five watts too high. And that's a 1.9% error, but five watts is it's very, um, like uh, it's something that you see all the time uh, when I when I ride with my bar meter and I put it on the on a, an ergometer, you know there's there's always a bit of disagreement and five watts is within the range of disagreements that you observe typically. So if my power meter reads too high, instead of going at 275 watts, I'm gonna go at 270 watts because uh, that's what I I'll read 275 watts, but in reality. I'll be going at 270 watts. And uh, according to the model, now I wouldn't, because I'm going at a lower power, I, I would be able to sustain that power for a much longer duration. So instead of being able to sustain it for uh, 1200 seconds, I would be able to sustain it for 1900 seconds. And so the small error in the power meter of 1.9% becomes a massive 60.5% time difference. And so the question I, would, I just want to raise there is that people using the critical power model or uh, to, to track their W prime in, in real life, in real time on, uh, during a race, for example, well, we can ask if the, the, the measuring tools that they're using at the moment are accurate enough to capture, um, to, to capture those, those, those big error propagations that we observe. And another aberration, and that's the, 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 the main aberration that was, uh, that was raised by uh, Goro Stiega uh, in his article is that uh, the, the model is very sensitive to the, the range of duration that we use to, uh, to fit it. So for instance, if I use durations between two and 15 minutes, which is what is recommended the, in the literature, I obtain the, the critical power and W prime that I mentioned before. So 262 watts and 15.8 kilojoules. And the, uh, the goodness of fit is, is, is almost perfect, it's 0.99. And if I use a different uh, range of duration, for instance, between five and 30 minutes, now I observe a critical power of 243 watts and a W prime of 28.6 kilojoules but the goodness of fit is still 0.99. So then I can ask like, what, what durations are optimal? Is there, is there a range of duration that you, you, you better, you're better off using when you're doing a certain kind of distance? Uh, and, and the other question is why using uh, durations between two and 15 minutes as it was initially proposed in the literature, is it just some arbitrary distance in a, a, a arbitrary durations in order to have a, some kind of standard when you talk about critical power or uh, W prime, or is it really, is there really a rational be behind uh, those durations? And so uh, it, it appears clear to us now that the, 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 the critical power model is, uh, is, is quite limited with the, the three aberration that we just saw we can see that there are some obvious limits to the model. And there has been other models after the critical power models that have worked towards improving those limits. For instance, 
there has been the three parameter critical power model uh, developed by Morton that was focused towards uh, correcting uh, the aberration where uh, the power blows up as time tends to zero. And there's uh, two very uh, excellent models to fit the data. For instance, the, the Pernitzbo model and the omni-domain model. But those models are, they, they, fit, uh, uh, they fit the data very well. For, uh, for example, the, the Pernitzbo model has an error of less than 1% uh, to predict uh, the world record performance uh, for running, but the models are much more complex. So they are based on many more parameters and the equations behind are uh, much more complex. So as you can see, this is a, a picture taken from the same article from Leo, but you can see that uh, the, the, you can see below that there's a, there's a certain range where the model converged with the data. And as we saw with the, the two parameter critical power model, the, the range of uh, convergence is very limited. And then uh, the two parameter model, the range is, uh, is uh, perhaps a bit bigger because, uh, because it corrected the, the assumption for short duration. And then the Pernitzbo and the Omni domain uh, model have a much larger convergence window, but there are, there's a cost to that uh, accuracy of the model and that cost is complexity. So the model are much more complex. And because they are more complex, they are much harder to, uh, to uh, apply in real life. And, uh, and then it, it, this leads me to our, our final point of discussion and it's the ability to pursue model. And uh, so we need, we need a model that, because uh, now we acknowledge that the, the, there are some obvious limitations uh, be, uh, of the critical power model. And there are other models, continuous exercise models that, that probably do a better job at uh, representing uh, performance in general. And so we wanna create a model that leaves the, the critical power concept uh, behind a little bit. And, uh, one of the avenues is uh, it's the hydraulic models that has been discussed uh, a few months uh, a few months ago by uh, Vagan uh, and uh, he did a, a, an awesome job at describing his models and uh, I'll uh, I'll encourage you to go and watch his presentation because it was really very really well explained but this is not the uh, the uh, the avenue that uh, that we've been working on uh, over the last few months. Um, Essentially, if we, if we want to leave the, the critical power concept behind, uh, it's, it's a hard task because as I mentioned before, the critical power is a very convenient way to work with intermittent exercise. And the reason again is because it's a limit and the critical power acts as a limit. And then you can, you can easily define a zone where above the limit you're depleting energy and below the limit you're um, repleting energy but in reality it's a bit more complex than that and we can easily argue that there is no such thing as a, a limit a critical power there's no such thing as as, as this limit so so, but the, so we've been working on on, on a new approach and uh, we call it the, the ability to pursue effort. And the ability to pursue the effort during uh, exercise is actually a, a quite strange and complex uh, phenomenon. And, uh, I'm just gonna start by giving you a, 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 an example, and it's a pretty obvious example, but if I do some repetitions of one minute at the power, I can sustain over 20 minutes, uh, over 10 minutes. Uh, I might be able to do 15 or even 20 repetitions depending on the rest. So I'm able to accumulate a lot more time at intensity than if I was doing the effort continuously. And let's say I recover at 200 watts. This means that the recovery, the, the, the time I spent at 200 watts recovering, it helps me accumulate more time at the end uh, it helps me accumulate more time uh, at uh, my target intensity. And uh, this means that my recovery, it improves my ability to pursue as I go through my, uh, as I go through my training session. So we can, 
view our training as uh, again an, uh, an alternance of uh, periods of uh, effort at high intensity where my ability to pursue goes down and period of recovery where my ability to pursue goes up. But the problem is a bit more complex than that because uh, if I do, let's say a single bout of effort at 200 watts, so the, 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 the power that I use for my recovery, we know that eventually I'll get to exhaustion. It might take a few hours, but I'll get to exhaustion. So it means that in certain scenarios, the 200 watts uh, enables me to, to uh, improve my ability to pursue. And in other scenarios, my, I work at the same work intensity and my ability to pursue goes down. Um, so we deduce that the, the, the ability to pursue, it doesn't only depend on intensity. There's other factors that have an influence on, on your ability to pursue as the, the session, uh, as the session goes, uh, goes through. And uh, we, all, we, we believe that the other factors are your, the, 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 the three, uh, the three key performance factors so uh, of an athlete. So for instance, is VO2 max, is endurance, is anaerobic capacity. And then we also think that the time elapsed since the beginning of the session has an influence. And also that the intensity, of course, has an influence on uh, how the ability to pursue will, uh, will go down or go up. And so to verify how those the, 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 factor, the factors that I just mentioned are interacting with each other um, and influence the ability to pursue, pursue your effort over a, a session, we, uh, we will start by uh, simulating different uh, interval training sessions. And, uh, and, and we will use for the simulation the modified Coggin model because so far in our research, we have shown that depending on the the, 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 the athlete profile that you use, it's the model that shows the, the less limitations and that give us the, the, the best uh, uh, degree of freedom on how we can set the different parameters. And so using uh, those simulations and some regression uh, techniques, we, we want to highlight those, uh, those interactions. So we wanna see how, uh, if there exists a link and how those, uh, those different uh, parameters um, or factors that are influence the ability to pursue uh, evolve during a training session. And then later on, we want to replace the simulations by some quality field data and just do the same thing, basically through regression techniques, find, uh, find how exactly uh, the, 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 the ability to pursue is influenced by the different uh, factors. And then finally, uh, yeah, and, and uh, why do we use uh, one quality field data and what do we mean by quality field data? Well, it's essentially uh, interval trainings, the data taken from interval trainings that will essentially lead to exhaustion. And the exhaustion is, is important because when we look at continuous exercise models, uh, because usually it's taken from world records or maximal, uh, maximal mean power or it's always a performance that is maximal. It gives a, a, an objective criteria and the, all the performances are, are equivalent because they all lead to exhaustion. So we need to have um, interval training sessions that have different setup, but they all lead to exhaustion so that we can compare them and see what the, what's the mathematical relationship between them. And we believe that this approach it should help us to find a model that works, but also that, as you see, is completely uh, separated from the, the critical power concept. Yes. And uh, once we will have that model that works, our main goal is to develop a, a, a new graphical tool, much like the, 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 the Thibault graphical tool that I, that I showed you at the beginning. And uh, because it's, it's, a, it's a very easy way to, uh, to interact with the, for, for the practitioners, it's an easy way to interact. It's very synthetic. It's easy to explore, to go through the, the, the graphical tool and to, to explore the different session and to choose the one that better fits your, your needs and, and your objectives. And, uh, and so 
once we have the model that works, we will create a graphical tool and we will make it available for practitioners so that they can use it and uh, implement workouts um, in their uh, in their respective environments to build session that uh, that match the 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 goals and the needs of their athlete and their particular characteristics. So uh, that's it for the for the presentation. We we can now go through uh, two questions and. Uh, I, I left my uh, my email and the, the ones of uh, Jonathan and, and Guy uh, in case uh, in case uh, you have uh, you have ideas you, you you would like to share uh, with us or also if you want to collaborate or you have uh, you have actually quality data available we're always open uh, for collaboration so uh, thank you right on thanks uh, Jeremy for the interesting uh, presentation uh, so I'll open it up for questions. Um, I guess uh, while we're waiting, so either you can unmute and uh, and 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 ask, uh, or uh, just uh, send me the question in the chat. Um, so, okay, so uh, yeah, you definitely did a good job of uh, covering the available models and their their limitations. I guess, like you know, to me, uh, when we talk about optimizing interval training, like your your object, your your primary objective, it seems, is, is around exhaustion or like what's going to lead to exhaustion, but really like. To me, the, the key question is what's going to maximize the training stimulus, and and also, but 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 also minimizing the negative effects of the interval training, right? So it's it's sort of like this parabolic type uh, balance where you're you you know, like you know, if you read Skiba's books on practical, you know, the, the endurance training, like he he explicitly recommends never to shell to yourself in his words. Uh, so really, you know, we want to avoid, I think, in many instances, going to, to exhaustion. Um, so can you reconcile uh, or like, have you considered other objectives uh, for your models and like uh, how you might uh, achieve that? Yes, I think uh, no, you, you raised a good point uh, regarding uh, the training stimulus. And that's probably the reason why we don't we don't have the type of data necessarily that we want because there, there's a lot of people doing uh, interval uh, training. You know, my, myself, I'm doing a lot of uh, interval training on, on, a, on a regular basis. But as you say, we rarely go to, um, to exhaustion. And uh, the, the, the reason why is uh, obviously because uh, uh, you, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's very demanding. And uh, and uh, you don't you don't necessarily want to go in that uh, exhaustion zone when you're training because you 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 fall at risk of uh, of or overtraining and uh, and you know all those uh, those, those pitfalls. But and, and there's also been uh, in the literature, uh, you know, for instance, if we look at the high intensity double training or uh, the the work of uh, Martin Gibala, it's it's all uh, towards uh, getting the 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 the, the the, the the minimal dose response basically so you can do very little and stimulate uh, you know uh, metabolic pathways that will uh, that with very little exercise help you get uh, get the most uh, out of your training so i think uh, i think for us the idea is that we we have to start with exhaustion because it, it's it's an objective criteria and uh, it, it just means that every session that we're modeling are based on the same objective criteria so even though at the beginning it doesn't necessarily it doesn't necessarily apply because it's a session that are leading to exhaustion we think that having this model will eventually help us better understand how the, the different factors interact and then in the end uh, facilitate the prescription even if we prescribe a session that doesn't necessarily lead to exhaustion yeah no i, I think that that makes some sense um, I'm going to go to Normand uh, next and then to Joel uh, after that. So Normand, go ahead. Hi, hey, Jeremy. It's, uh, it's nice to see another Francophone uh, sports scientist out there. <laughs> um, this is not super related to your research per se, but as your experience as a triathlete, do you find or would, what's your opinion on varying the time for rest intervals between sports modalities? So running is more load bearing and kind of maybe harder on the musculoskeletal system versus cycling or swimming is you could maybe get in more intensity with a little bit less rest because it's um, less of an impact. Uh, yes. Um, so I think, um, yeah, it's uh, from, from my personal, personal experience, I think uh, different, the uh, varying the sports 
the 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 way you recover is slightly different. So I find that uh, when you when you're doing uh, cycling, uh, because probably I think it's because the the probably the sport is uh, a lot more muscular, but it takes a bit more time to recover. So if I do uh, sometimes I do equivalent session, and I find that I need extra rest to to recover in cycling compared to running, and I think. The one that necessitates the less recovery is probably swimming, but I, I think it's an important, it's an interesting point that you raise because with our model, it's obviously something that we want to capture. It, it, like when you when you change the modality of exercise, how does it affect the the the, the duration of the rest, or uh, how can you uh, how does it affect the, the intensity of the rest and and so on? So uh, yes, I think it definitely has a, an impact. The, the 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 exercise modality in, uh, for the for the for the rest and uh, it's something that uh, we're trying to capture but yes i don't know if it totally answers your question but yeah i i, I observe that there's a difference between the different modalities of exercise yep thank you very much great thanks Noma. um uh, joel hey jeremy Great, great presentation. I think these are great conversations and, you know, great things to think about. I guess I had two questions for you. I guess the first one would be, uh, how do you define exhaustion? Because I think that is important when we're talking about fatigue to kind of clearly define it. Yeah, so, um, yeah, no, that's a good point. And it's something that is quite uh, debated, the exhaustion. But uh, the way we see it is that, uh, um, well, the way Guy always defined it for like when, when we discuss exhaustion is that if you're doing a, an interval training and uh, you have to take a much longer rest um, in like after after the last repetition, if you need a, a much longer rest, it means you're exhausted. But obviously, you'll never um, you'll never come to a point where you have totally exhausted all your resources because even after a race or after a world record, you see the the the, the runners they are able to walk or the, sometimes they're they they, they 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 are even able to jog around the stadium so i think uh, the idea of exhaustion is uh, it's um, yeah it, it's 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 a tough concept but uh, for us it's it, it just means that when you, you get to a point where you really have to slow down like if you're doing a, a time to exhaustion for instance you will maintain a certain power and at a certain point you cannot uh, sustain the cadence and you have to slow down. So that for us is, is exhaustion. That makes sense. Yeah, no, that's, that's good to know. And I think my other one was with your, uh, the ability to pursue model for your rest interval and kind of rest um, intensity, are those remaining constant or are those uh, able to vary within the model? Yeah, no, we want to vary it. So now we, we, uh, so I, as I said, I think uh, the the uh, we want to explore how the intensity that you're at, that you're going how does it. Oh, I think we've lost uh, Jeremy. Uh, I didn't know if I I froze her. <laughs> yeah, hopefully he comes back. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, let me see here. There he's uh, back. He's back. Yeah, I I stopped the share, so I uh, I uh, hopefully it helps. But uh, yeah, so um, so I'm gonna start uh, at the beginning of the the answer. Uh, basically, uh, yes, we want to uh, we want to to see how the intensity of the rest will affect the ability to pursue. Because uh, yes, uh, as I said, we want to see how actually the uh, the intensity that you're going and all the other factors are influencing. Uh, the, your ability to pursue basically so uh, of course uh, we, uh, we 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 assume that uh, when you vary the intensity there's going to be a, a, a direct impact on on your ability to pursue now i think the 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 the, 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 the challenge is that if you want to have some quality field data where you vary the rest intensity it just opens up the the the, the amount of possibilities that you need to test and uh, and that makes it very hard to get the to get some uh, so, so, some data on such a large uh, large sample or a, a large spectrum. What about that's yeah that's great. I think that makes perfect sense. What about in terms of and this is one thing I've always wondered about with you know the 
a D prime balance modeling. And Dave, I'd love your thoughts on this too. It's, it's kind of like, should we, like, is it all the same? Like sometimes like that would say that passive rest is probably going to replenish the fastest, but is there maybe considerations for low level active recovery that might be beneficial as well? You know, maybe all rest kind of isn't, isn't linear in a sense. And, and that sometimes maybe active rest, I think, especially you as a triathlete, you probably, you know, sometimes you don't want to sit at the wall and sometimes I think a lot of swimming, you'd say like active rest is a very large part of that recovery. I think, um, so I, I don't know if there's any considerations or any kind of literature based off that, um, but when we're looking at kind of rest or intensity as well. You mean how much does the rest intensity influence the, the recovery? Yeah. Cause sometimes like, I think even like low level active recovery, there might be something there as well versus, you know, versus passive versus, you know, obviously you're not going to replenish as fast if it's higher level recovery but, yeah kind of that idea yeah i can let the I, I, after my answer i can let dave uh, give his, his own answer but from my perspective i think uh, passive rest is the one that you, you will uh, recover the most and if you look at the uh, the equations that's what happens basically when you're passive that's where you recover uh, the most your 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 d prime or your w prime and and in real life there's some studies that i've shown that uh, it's it's indeed the the case yeah yeah, I think uh, so. You know, a lot of the active rest concepts come from lactate uh, measurements, which you know, it, in the past, people used to think it was a fatigue-inducing metabolite. And I guess I suppose you could argue that it is uh, when combined with other, you know, ATP and the other factors that cause feedback uh, via the group three and four afferents. But overall, you you deplete lactate faster when you know you use it right as a metabolite or as an energy uh, as a substrate. So that's why the active rest, uh, you know, it, 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 you see a decrease in the lactate levels, but really um, overall, I think uh, as Jeremy mentioned, like a lot of the evidence points to passive rest being better, but you're right. The models do assume that all rest is sort of equal in a sense, that, or there's a linear relationship. The, the, the lower the, um, uh, you know, the intensity of the recovery period, the faster you'll, you'll, uh, you'll recover. That's great. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Dave. Um, okay. So I uh, don't know if we have any other, I don't see any other questions in the chat just right now. I've, so uh, I do have one. So you, so you talk about a regression modeling approach, which I, you know, I think makes sense. So it's, you know, sort of a linear sum of all the different factors that could affect, uh, I guess, exhaustion during these intervals. Um, but that's, uh, you know, that's a pretty fraught uh, approach yeah. um, because, uh, of the number of factors that you one might include, but also like, you know, there's like, how do you, how are you going to do this? You know, I'm picturing a session, you have numbers of reps and um, like, how do you summarize uh, all of the factors, I guess, into a single equation that doesn't have a time dependency in it. So, you know, the sequencing of uh, the work and rest bouts, uh, you know, themselves might have an effect and it's hard to like, uh, you know, you could quantify the total amount of rest or the total, you know, like the, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's yeah. just, a, it seems to me a very complicated equation and would need a lot of data. And especially if yeah. you're going to start doing higher order interaction terms, like, are you going to cut them out at two, you know, two level uh, interactions? Or are you going to go higher than that? Do you think? So for now, um, so, so, so now I think the, 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 the first step for like, when we mentioned the simulations, the, the easiest way to do it uh, at first to see the interaction between the parameters is to use a, a similar approach that has been, uh, that has been used uh, to assess the, the replenishment of the W prime. So it's to use a, a setup where there's only two or maybe a, let's say, yeah, two repetitions of effort and, and a, a, a rest in between. So, uh, so basically, we, we can have, let's say, a, 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 like a, a, a various setups where the, the first interval is, uh, is a, a different intensity for different durations and everything. And so we get an idea of when the recovery start at what uh, point the, 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 or to what, to what level is the, the, the ability to pursue at that time. And then we get an idea of how if, if we, if we, during the, the recovery phase, we vary the intensity and the duration and so on, we can get an idea of uh, how uh, the, 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 the ability to pursue is replenished or, or keeps going down even. And, and then the idea is to, 
um, to have uh, multiple uh, cases where we're going to explore different scenarios and then and then to try to fit an equation. But as you say, fitting an equation for 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 that much parameters might be hard. So the first step will probably be to uh, to have a, a, an hypothesis on the the relationship and then work with the hypothesis and go back and forth and then see. Uh, if the data confirms the hypothesis and then no, like, go back, change the formula a bit and then go back and forth like this. I think that's probably going to be the the, 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 the the better option because otherwise we can obviously fit uh, complex regression models, but it, it can become uh, almost a black box. And that's not the, that's not what we want. We want to be able to uh, to understand the interaction. Well, as a, an experimentalist at heart, I uh, appreciate that the you know, design of experiments methodologies might become uh, useful here to reduce your sampling space, but to build nice response service models. So uh, I, I do think this sounds cool and uh, you know, wish you the best in it, of course. Thank you. Okay, is there any other questions? Please uh, feel free to raise your hand or unmute and, and ask away. All right, well, I think we're good. So I'm gonna stop the recording. And, but before I do, I just wanna thank uh, Jeremy, for your uh, for joining us and for your presentation. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Thibault and Dr. Trombley for joining us as well. And uh, take care, everyone. And I'll be in touch with uh, the next talk once it's uh, planned. Take care, everyone. Thank you.